The current Secretary of Defense of the United States of America, James Noah Mattis, had a long career in the Marine Corps and served at nearly all levels of command, ranging from a battalion during the Gulf War up to U.S. Joint Forces Command and U.S. Central Command. Now this video is focused on how Mattis approached his commands and overcame various challenges in Afghanistan 2001 and Iraq 2003. Luckily in 2014, Major Michael Valenti from the U.S. Marine Corps wrote a case study titled the Mattis Way of War, which is the primary source for this video. So let's get started. The case study looked at two major parts, the structure and operation of Task Force 58 during the initial stages of the war in Afghanistan in 2001, and at Mattis' command of the 1st Marine Division in Iraq 2003. Based on the analysis of these commands, several aspects can be derived about Mattis' principles, leadership approaches and command style. So let's start with some principles and characteristics of James Mattis. First of is his scholarly approach. Mattis is known for his reverence to military history and other writings, sometimes stating that there's nothing new under the sun. According to US Today, he amassed at one point the library of 7,000 volumes. Although this also includes regular titles like fiction, to quote, he read literature because he was often said war is a human endeavor and fiction provides a window into the heart. This notion that war is a human endeavor means there is also a constant in war over the centuries, the human element. Now the following quote from Mattis exemplifies this aspect very well. Alexander the Great would not be in the least bit perplexed by the enemy that we face right now in Iraq. And our leaders going into this fight do their troops a disservice by not studying. Studying wise just reading. The men who have gone before us. Yet this quote contains even more information. Note that he clearly makes a difference between studying and reading. My experience is that a lot of people that just read history usually just use it or abuse it for their arguments. Additionally, some people apply history in an if A then B scheme, which for the most part only makes sense with a load of hindsight, while usually often ignoring the context of the time and the temporary relevant factors. Now if you just read something, you know stuff. If you study something, you understand it, of course under the assumption that you succeed. Understanding history means that in some cases you can derive frameworks and lessons or models that can be reused if the context is well understood. This is why Mattis advocates the studying of history, because it can provide mental models. But let's get back to the main topic. During preparations, Mattis assigned officers to study the enemy's commander prior to the invasion in Iraq 2003. Mattis stated in an interview with the author of the case study that if he could outfight the enemy commander, he wouldn't have to fight his troops. This is clearly Long Sun Tzu's concept that one should know his enemy, and also that the acme of skill is to defeat an enemy without fighting. Mattis' focus on studying and learning also was extended to the requirements of staff positions. He wanted multifaceted members on his staff that were not limited to their field or staff section. This was especially crucial, since for his operations with Task Force 58 in Afghanistan, he had to operate with a very small staff. His overall requirement for capable and informed people is very well reflected in his foreword for the book Operational Culture of the Warfighter. Culturally savvy marines are a threat to our enemies, so study, challenge and implement the principles you study in this text. Now being well read and smart is one thing, but let's be honest, it doesn't get anything done. This is where aggression comes in, because aggression gets shit done. Mattis demanded the aggressive officers, this is cited several times in the study. Additionally, he made sure that the rules of engagement were sufficient for the intended mission. For instance, in Afghanistan, he considered the rules of engagement too restrictive for the assault force. He officially requested that all personnel in the landing zone be declared hostile, which would allow the ground commanders to engage targets at will. This also corresponds with the command principles of METIS, namely that the responsible should be delegated to the lowest capable level. This change of rules of engagement ensured that the local commander could use his own judgment for which targets to engage or not engage, and thus not waste initiative nor take unnecessary risks. Now aggression is just one important aspect of warfare, another important yet probably surprising aspect is diplomacy. Now there are two types of people, one type thinks that the opposite of talking is shutting up, the other type thinks the opposite of talking is listening. Mattis seems to be part of the second group. In one interview he stated that when he went to Pakistan, he was confronted with officers that were sometimes quite disgruntled with US policy. Mattis noted that in such occasions it is very important to listen carefully, understand the other side and address the issue at hand. Now there are other reasons why diplomacy is important. For instance, nowadays wars are often fought with coalition forces. 
something Matt has stated several times. And it is probably best summed up with this quote from Mattis about harmony. In this age, I don't care how tactically or operational brilliant you are, if you cannot create harmony, even vicious harmony, on the battlefield based on trust across service lines, across coalition and national lines, and across civilian military lines, you need to go home because your leadership is obsolete. We have got to have officers who can create harmony across all those lines. Now from harmony, let's move to commanding. Matt is noted that the only command around 15 minutes per day, the rest of the day is actually coaching and creating conditions that his troops could succeed in. His approach of commanding was more along the lines of teacher and student or even father and son and not master and servant. His focus on empowering and trust also meant that his marines were allowed to make decisions on their own judgment. Additionally, about command and control, Matt is mentioned that he doesn't use command and control, but command and feedback. He believes that on the battlefield everything is too fast to be controlled from the upper echelons. And thus local commanders should act upon the intent of the commander and the mission at hand, which should be communicated properly. Thus for Mattis, command and control is about communication and coordination. Which brings us to the next point, communication. It is a key element that connects everything together. After all, Mattis is well known for his various quotes and his messages that resonate with devil dogs and even with politicians across party lines. And as nearly every great communicator, he honed that skill for ages. Since 1979, Mattis had kept journals of quotes or ideas that have struck him. Today, their notebooks are free loose leaf binders and cover a broad range of subjects and ideas. For Mattis, it is very important that his troops understand the mission and commander's intent. Because if they have a clear understanding of the bigger picture, they can determine the best necessary action in the area of operations immediately and thus exploit opportunities that arise on the battlefield. Note that this seems quite similar to the German Auftragstaktik, which means mission tactics from World War II and before, that gave the commanders mostly free reign on how they would achieve their objective. Now since we got some of the major principles covered, let's look at some of the approaches used by Mattis to improve his command and to overcome various challenges in Afghanistan and in Iraq. The first one is skip echelon, which is a concept to remove redundancy at certain levels of command. This was necessary due to the restrictions of space and other limitations during the operation of Task Force 58. Thus Mattis had to reduce his staff considerably. For those people that followed my organization's videos, you're probably aware that most military units are organized in very similar patterns. For instance, a battalion usually consists of three companies and those again consist of three platoons. Quite often a subunit is a smaller copy of its parent unit with similar command and combat elements. This is where Skip Echelon comes in. To quote, for example, not every level necessitated a chaplain, public affairs officer, medical personnel, etc. If these personnel were required to perform a function, they would simply skip an echelon up or down the chain of command in order to fulfill their requirement. Of course, the reduction in staff members also brought various challenges. For instance, every member of the staff was required to be able to fulfill various roles. In order to speed up the training of new members, a so-called brain book was introduced, which contained valuable references for new members to speed up their learning. Of course, a small staff can also have benefits. Mattis was convinced that a small staff has more situational awareness and is also faster in reacting. Note that Skip Echelon concept was probably derived from the ideas for Field Marshal Slim and or from a captured Iraqi officer. Next is Logistics Light. Due to Mattis' focus on speed during the invasion of Iraq 2003, he transformed the division's logistical element. Similarly to the command element, the logistical element was reduced in numbers. During the restructure, the size of the Logistics Operations Center was reduced from 120 to 26 personnel. Additionally, the Logistics Operations Center was tied to the Command Operations Center, thus allowing for faster responses and better integration with operations. Yet the Logistics Operations Center was just one part of the concept of Logistics Light. Another aspect was to transform the whole division into a lean organization. He instructed the staff to think like a brigade and not a division. Additionally, he lowered the living standards for the whole division. Everybody was expected to sleep on the ground and not in a cot, which is a folding bed. As a result, eight medium lift tactical vehicles could be used for other purposes. Still, the division had around 5,000 vehicles in order to conserve fuel, expand the capacity and improve supply several measures were taken. First, it was a court martial offense to waste fuel by idling. Second, every vehicle was fitted with gypsy racks to carry additional fuel, food and water. Third, fuel test kits were distributed in order to test captured fuel to repurpose it for the division. 
These measures increase the range and reduce the dependence on the logistical train, thus increasing the overall speed of the division. It was already mentioned that Metis puts a strong emphasis on communication, yet communication has its limits. For planning the invasion of Iraq 2003, Metis used a rather hands-on approach. He didn't do a visualization of the upcoming battle, but the physilication, and he did it with Lego bricks. Something I personally find quite ironic, because Lego is well known for not having any realistic military equipment for ethical reasons in their lineup, and Metis used those bricks to plan an invasion. The so-called Lego drill included the purchase of 6000 Lego bricks of which each represented a vehicle of the division. This allowed to check the position and prioritization of the vehicles during the planning, in order to avoid traffic jams, increase situational awareness and other issues. During the drill, each unit was assigned its Lego vehicles and to move them. These drills were finally performed on large-scale terrain models of around 100 per 100 meters, prepared by engineers with unit representatives wearing numbered colored jerseys according to the unit. Thus they were also known as jersey drills. This allowed for the rehearsal of the operational plan, increase awareness about the terrain and other units involved, in a more physical and direct form than just a map with several counters on it. Now before we come to the conclusion, General Mattis also used another way to improve communications. He used so-called informers that were called Juliets. Although in this case they informed him. These officers only reported to him. The issue could be anything like an exposed flank or a moral problem. Now an important aspect with these Juliets was that they were acting in support and didn't undermine the authority of their commanders or broke the chain of command. So Mattis made sure that the commanders knew that the Juliets were their friends and provided additional support for the unit. Now let's move to the conclusion. These approaches and principles had several goals, yet one clear focus was to improve speed of Mattis units, where speed meant faster execution and decision making processes. Speed was central for Mattis. The division scheme of maneuver was based on the concept that speed equals success. So many of these approaches were means to an end, but you might ask why this need for speed? Now the overall focus of speed makes probably more sense with some background information. Maneuver is one of the two basic components of combat, the other is firepower. You might associate with the term maneuver the word movement, but nowadays maneuver warfare focuses more on time than space. Theory suggests that the party that acts consistently faster gains often a large and decisive advantage. Mattis ensured speed by various measures and on different levels. His small staff could observe, communicate and act faster. By communicating his intent to the troops prior to battle, they always were aware of the big picture and thus could exploit tactical opportunities immediately. This was also aided by the Lego drills that gave the respective unit command a clear model and experience of the whole operation and units involved. Furthermore, by optimizing the logistical terrain it was leaner and better integrated with combat operations. Now remember this line from my room clearing video? Shock slows and disrupts an enemy and may even paralyze the enemy's ability to fight or physically stun the enemy. Surprise and speed magnify the effects of shock. From a different perspective, Matt is aimed at overwhelming the enemy's nervous system with speed and aggressive action. Now a final remark here, be aware that this is my first look at General Mattis and this list is not complete and just my personal take on the case study by Major Malenti. If you have anything to add, please let me know in the comment section. As always, sources are in the description. If you want to know more about military history, I suggest my analysis playlist or if you're more into bombing ships, maybe this video about Japanese bomber tactics is more to your liking. Anyway, thank you for watching and see you next time.